It was great. The team before starting my, formally started my position here, I went to the Wisdom of the And I said to her, I'm going to be the interim president over at SEC. And I'm looking for all the events and activities that we can get the college involved with in the community. I want to blow the doors off the campus to bring the community onto the campus. And I want us to go out and do and sponsor and host activities in the community. So for SEC to become what is our goal, which is the community's college, your college, we need to be involved in the fabric of the social economic um, part of Orange. Everything that is Orange. We, have, we want you on this campus. We want to be involved in the most important events and activities that are going on, civic engagements. So it's one of the reasons that we are hosting um, this forum here today is because part of what SCC needs to do is to be right in the middle of everything. And so I thank you for being here today, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be able to look out for more of the events and activities that we're going to be hosting and be all over the city of Orange. So thank you once again for being here. We have the privilege of introducing our distinguished moderator. Ambassador Dan Vasquez has been a resident of Orange for half a century. That's in the script. <laughs> <laughs> he is a product, a product of local public schools and began his 26 year career in public service as a police officer in the city of Orange. He went on to serve the state as an appointee of three California governors including duties as Chief Deputy Appointment Secretary to Governor George Major. He was nominated by the President of the United States and confirmed by the U.S. Senate as the 15th Director of the U.S. Peace Corps, where he led programs in 78 countries. He, later, he was later nominated to serve as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, agencies in Rome, Italy, where he served from 2006 through 2009. He also served Orange County as County Supervisor and had an exceptional career in the private sector as Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for Edison International and Southern California Edison. He is the recipient of the Thomas Island Medal of Honor, the Pat Brown Institute International Leadership Award, the Globe and Anchor Award from the Marine Scholarship Foundation, the, Con the Constitutional Rights Foundation Award, and is the recipient of six honorary doctorates. He's a graduate of the University of Redlands and a proud alum of San Ana College. He has lived abroad <laughs> has lived abroad in your state and nation's capital, but has always come home to Orange. Uh, I do want to say on a personal note, um, I've looked up to, to Gaddy Vasquez for many, many years. Uh, I consider him one of the greatest leaders in this county and a uh, mentor of mine. Please help me welcome our moderator for this evening, Ambassador Danny Messi. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is great to see such a great turnout here this evening. Part of our democracy is civic engagement and participation in the political process and the electoral process at every level of our great country. And so I thank you for taking time out of busy schedules and I want to acknowledge those who are watching by streaming tonight. Welcome to tonight's town hall. Uh, this is a, an opportunity for us to hear from the candidates in Districts 1, District 3, District 4, and District 6, and candidates for Mayor of the City of Orange. As was mentioned, uh, I am very proud uh, to be a citizen of Orange. Now he said half a century and actually it's more than half a century. <laughs> I have to say. Uh, I attended West Orange Elementary School for Tola now we call it middle school, he was junior high then, and Orange High School. And then had the opportunity to attend Santa Ana College, and then on to the University of Zen Chapel, which is probably within Chapel College. So it's great to be on this, this phenomenal campus, and we are, are very, very much appreciative of the opportunity to be able to participate in tonight's event. We want to give, as you can imagine, we want to give the candidates ample time to share their views, their thoughts, and backgrounds. So your cooperation in helping us move the program along will ensure that we give everyone a fair and equal opportunity to respond to questions. I want to make it very, very clear that tonight is a forum. It is not a debate. It is a forum. And it is a forum to give all of us the opportunity to hear from the candidates. 
So therefore, your assistance in the polling of laws right, until the end of a segment, and by segment, I mean district, and then eventually the mayor's uh, discussion will come at the end of the next program. And other forms of, of expression or refraining from other forms of expression will be greatly, greatly appreciated. The format for tonight's forum is as follows. Each candidate will have the opportunity to present a one minute opening statement. Their statements will be followed by a series of questions that have been developed by the chamber, its members, and some members of the public who submitted questions for tonight's forum. The chamber had to limit the questions uh, due to time constraints, and we'll try to make the best of it, uh, but identify themes and areas of interest in formulating questions for tonight's forum. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each question, and each district segment will end with a quick lightning round of questions that will help us learn more about the candidates on you know, a sort of a personal but friendly level, if you get my grip. And you'll see what I mean uh, when we get to that part of the program this evening. In advance, I want to thank you for your attention to the courtesies that we've outlined for tonight's forum. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. Uh, and let me clarify that I uh, received a notice just moments ago that our first segment today for District 1 candidates is now one candidate in that Mr. Jason White uh, notified the planners for tonight's event that he was exposed uh, to the COVID uh, virus. And therefore, uh, while he may not, as I was told, was in an environment where he had maybe some exposure and out of due caution on his part, and thank him for that, uh, that he refrained from coming tonight to participate in tonight's forum. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Mariana Barrios to the podium for a conversation with me. Whichever you want. It's great to see you. Nice to see you as well. A one minute opening seat. Um, hello, everyone. Um, like, as you said, my name is Ariana Barrios. I am a lifelong resident of Orange, actually, in the house I grew up in. Um, there's so much wonderful about Orange. It's hard to fill it all in a one minute. Um, I've been on the council for about 18, 20 months now, so um, I was the first elected representative for District 1, which encompasses Old Town. Um, I have a nice square box district. Um, it has been <clears> the greatest <throat> honor of my life. Register your domain and start your website. Um, people I grew up with, people who taught me, people who protected me, um, people who made sure that I became the good citizen that I am today and allowed me to, in turn, give back to my community. Um, it's been hard too. It's hard because the world is changing. And it's changing quickly, but it doesn't mean we don't. Have to, we can't be kind to each other. We can't help each other in the way that I know was important to me when I grew up, and that is certainly a value that I want to instill in others and keep doing myself in practice every single day. So I'd be greatly honored to stay on as your council member for this report. Thank you very much. So. Question number one, two minutes to respond to this question. Uh, if you name the top three issues in Orange that concern you most, what would you do to address those issues uh, re-elected to the city council? Um, and I think you'll probably hear this over and over again tonight, public safety, um, the homeless problem. And for me in particular, it's really about protecting our historic resources in the city. That's a real different in every district depending on what the general issues are. In terms of public safety, I think that um, you'll, if you haven't heard it already, one of the things that we've already taken the steps to do is to add more police as well as add um, a new addition to our fire department. So as far as the police officers are concerned, we've added 11 police officers, but I want to be really clear about that. We added 11, and six of those 11 are positions that have been on the books for decades, and we unfroze them for the first time in decades. That was a really big step, but it's also indicative of some of the things that need to change at City Hall. In terms of the other positions, we're just doing this now and we're fighting against all the other bigger cities. Um, Anaheim wants to put in 40 cops, so we're going to be fighting to recruit and we have to look and be creative. What, what can we and what do we need to do to entice people to come here to Orange? That never used to be a problem, it is now. So we have to think about that. Is it pays? Is it salaries? As far as fire is concerned, we actually added a new ambulance um, program that actually brings EMS um, workers in. So they're not sworn officers, it's cheaper, 
but it takes the strain off of our firefighters who go out and actually fight the fires when they when they hit anywhere around our city, which we know we're vulnerable. In terms of homeless, um, many of you probably contacted me and the other city council members because of the closure of Mary's Kitchen. Um, there's a lot to say about that, and there's a lot that we can't say about that, but it is a really big issue that needs to be put out into the public space and be transparent. Because that issue is the worst of the worst. It is now left what, Mary, what was Mary's Kitchen, and now our parks and our streets, and we have to do something about it. It is not enough to say that the state has tied our hands. We can do more. And with that, I think, if, where am I? She's really mean, so I want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There is a timekeeper sitting here. Really <laughs> so, so here's here's a great question. Okay. Uh, if you received a million dollar grant to reduce the city, what would you do with it and why? So, okay, that's a great question for two reasons. One is because for you and I, a million dollars is like, woo, you know, for the city, that's like, oh, it's a million dollars. What are you going to do with that? You know, it doesn't seem like a lot. It doesn't go very far because we add so much onto it. Um, but in a perfect world, if I receive a million dollars right now, probably the first thing that I would do is I would... Just to be clear, to the city, not the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um, I would look specifically at which one of our parks needs the most help and add um, specific resources into the parks. Um, a lot of our equipment is running down, a lot of the uh, landscaping needs some help, so especially now that we can't water um, as much <clears> as we'd <throat> like to. So specifically, that's probably where I would put a million dollars. As a leader, how do you build consensus with people, and how would you apply your practices to provide leadership at the council level in a more impactful and effective way? Um, another great question. As a leader, leadership begins with listening, which sounds counterintuitive since all I'm doing is talking to y'all. But um, it starts with listening to what people are actually saying. A lot of times people come to the council or even with each other, we start out angry. And we're angry because we're passionate about what we believe in, or we come from a different point of view. There's nothing wrong with that. But being respectful of each other, having to quorum, making sure that you get heard and you get heard and I get heard is the way we start building consensus. I run a business, and if I just told everybody in my business, shut up, I'm not listening to you, I get nowhere and they leave. I'd be nowhere. I can't succeed, they can't succeed. And I'll probably get a terrible reputation about it too. That's a problem, and we need to look at our city and make sure that everyone's being heard. And a lot of residents over the last year contacted me in the last two years saying they are surprised that I called them back, that I emailed, that no one had ever listened to them, and I find that shame. So, Mr. White's absence has given me a little bit of range to build on some questions that maybe I didn't anticipate asking. Okay. But I will ask you this. So, the, the issue of having council districts in the city of Orange is relatively new. Do you have any early impressions of how that's working out? You know, it's, it, like anything, it's a double-sided coin. So on the one hand, um, I do think in some ways it makes us tribal. It makes me tribal. I think about my district and where do I need to focus on my district. My district's want to vote. Those are my voters. I answer to them. So it is hard to constantly be thinking outside of that box and making sure you're <coughs> representing the entire city. Now I come from the college district, so I spent many years in this room doing meetings from here. You are elected from district areas, so I was used to that. In terms of being um, in a district, it does make it easier for candidates to participate, for all candidates, all types of candidates to participate. Because it's cheaper, it's easier, you can walk a district, you know, in most cases you've probably known people forever. How would you balance the preservation of Old Town with the influx of new businesses? Because we all know I happen to grow up just a couple blocks from the Plaza. I never call it the Circle, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how, how would you balance that preservation of Old Town with obviously the influx of change if we're always the same network? Like anything else, balance. Balance is so important and with the Plaza now more than ever. So while the businesses and the revenue we get from business is great, we have to look at it all with balance. If we get too many bars, we become downtown Fullerton. If we let too many other retail come, then we lose revenue that we get from restaurants and, um, and the bar situation. 
But when we talk about balance, we have to be committed to that, and we cannot do it in fear. So I will give you a great example that happened this week. So we have um, one particular entity at the Old Town for coming forward to expand their services as a bar. Well, that bar backs up to residents. The police did a fantastic job saying exactly why it shouldn't be expanded. And the planning commission went against them. That's wrong. It creates an imbalance. And that balance is something where we have to have the courage to say, I know this isn't what everybody wants, but it's what's right in the long term for the community. So we really have to have those conversations. We need to look at the Old Town specific plan. One thing Laura Mayor Smith says all the time is we are actually at this point a victim of our own success. We've been so successful at growing the plaza and that whole area around the circle that we have to look at it. <laughs> uh, we have to look at it is do we have parking? If we in the city have we done the infrastructure changes? Now we're having direct impacts into the neighborhood. Is that what we wanted? Was that our intention? If we have not talked about all of those things, the magic parking structure that we keep shoving people into or not asking businesses to pay for parking and fees is going to create an imbalance that is unsustainable and will ruin what we love best about our city. Okay. Now on the fun part. Oh, good. <laughs> Last book read. Oh my gosh. Um, the Bobbiverse. Audio, I'm assuming audio books count. So. Least favorite topic in school? Ooh, that's a really good typing. I had to I think for a whole other those Yeah, I'm terrible. Favorite city park? Oh, man, um, it has to be hard. Sorry, hard park. <laughs> and fun fact, I actually work in Mr. Hart's old uh, building downtown, so really fun. The first pet? was a little stray dog called Tootie. <laughs> he was ugly, he had names, he smelled, but we loved him. So. <laughs> Your favorite musical artist? Uh, Linda Miranda. Okay. Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, or Twitter? Facebook. I'm old. I'm just kids wear out office and TikTok, but whatever, you just go video. So. <laughs> With that, one minute for a closing statement. I just want to thank everybody and for the people who are in my district and for the whole city, really. Thank you for letting me um, represent you. Um, I hope that what I bring to the council is, all, is a lot of experience, but also a lot of common sense. Um, that as more the more things change, we don't have to be nasty to each other. We can talk, we can figure out, um, and we need to do more strategic planning. We need to look ahead where we're going to be in 10 and 20 years. Because I think that that's important, and I'm really looking forward to having the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Please say thank you. Thank you. Sons and Daughters of Italy, as well as the Orange Chamber of Commerce. 
I have completed the Orange Citizens Police Academy as well as the Community Emergency Response Team, which is a testament to my commitment for the safety of Orange. And finally, I have worked to protect open space and defend our term limit ordinance. Through all of this, I have gained the knowledge and understanding of the workings of the city, and I'm committed to putting that knowledge and expertise to work for you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kathy Talavares. I'm the current councilwoman in District 3. Um, the only interesting thing about me that's interesting, I think, is that I'm the only person on the council that was not born in this country. I was not blessed to be born in this country, so I'm the only immigrant serving right now. Uh, I have lived in District 3 for 41 years, what is now District 3. I attended Chapter Elementary, Peralta Junior High, and Hill Park High School, all Orange Unified School Districts. I graduated California State University Long Beach with a major in political science and uh, emphasis on politics and policy formation. And in March 21, I answered a call to apply to be a uh, full vacancy on the Orange City Council, um, which I did. Uh, in the last 18 months, I have delivered results. I have canceled an unpopular and poorly planned uh, North Texas specific plan, which is good because we can no longer have to say that. I moved to hire new police officers for the first time in 22 years in the city of Orange. My priorities will continue to be public safety and the revitalization of the Mall of Orange. I have been endorsed by Orange County Firefighters, the Orange Police, and Orange County Sheriff Tom Barnes. Thank you very much. Mr. So Russo, you're first in uh, alphabetical order here. And the first question is, so small businesses are the lifeblood of commerce. What would be your plan to help retain and promote small businesses in Orange? That was a fantastic question. Um, throughout my time working to serve Orange at a higher level, I've met so many business owners. A lot of them have said that the startup time that it takes for their, their business is extremely long. That is no way a startup business can be fruitful here in the city of Orange. So what we need to do is work together, work with our business development, work with the Chamber of Commerce to shorten our startup process for new businesses. By limiting the red tape to cut through, we can increase businesses here in the city and experience an increase in revenue. Orange needs to be as business friendly as possible, and I want to work to make sure that we do that. I'm the daughter of a Greek immigrant, Mediterranean ticket. Um, and uh, what do Greeks do well besides the big baklava is they own restaurants. So all my life, uh, my father owned restaurants, and what he hated most, and I'm sure what most business owners hate most, is when you know the city comes knocking on the door and say you don't have a permit for this or you don't have a permit for that, and you need to pay your taxes for this and your taxes for that. Um, we have been going through that in Old Town right now, and the rest of Orange. We have to remember the rest of Orange. During the pandemic, the city council, I think, rightly opened the sale to help the businesses. And that did help some businesses, but other businesses were not helped. They had to stay closed. What can the city do to help uh, take the success that was the sale during the time of emergency and create that environment when we're not in a time of emergency? Orange has the fifth district, the third district, the second district, where we have great restaurants, hotels, businesses that we can that we cannot go to. Orange is not just Old Town. And it's not just East Chapman. So the next question we'll start with you is, so what, what is your approach to handling complicated public policy issues and the controversy that can sometimes accompany those issues? What controversy? Um, <coughs> we've been, I've been in the workforce for 30 years, and I have managed over hundreds of people and managed $13 million. And the best way to get things done is to make sure that you have Unfortunately, here in Orange, we have created controversy. 
Um, and what it takes is that we need to have leaders that work together, that can create policy that is best for the residents, preserving open space, making sure that we have responsible development. By working together, we can make sure that Orange is set with a stable future. Throughout my time as well, I have created relationships and have gotten to know a lot of people here in the room, a lot of people um, throughout the county of Orange. And so working together is really the way that we're going to do this, to find solutions that best work for Orange and that will best work for our residents. Thank you. No, I'll leave you so so the question is, what, what are your priorities regarding police and fire protection in the city? And please try to be specific. Sure. Um, it's very simple. We need to increase our public safety. That means more officers, more EMTs, more paramedics. Um, right now in Orange, we have anywhere between 8 to 15 officers patrolling the entire city of Orange at a given time. We need to increase that number. We need to make sure that the response for service is very low, and we need to make sure that our residents, when they make a call, that they are responding to in a timely manner. Right now, we are very, very fortunate that we support our first responders here in Orange. That's not the case all around the country. Um, our city has done a great job in making sure that our first responders are well-funded, and I'm going to continue doing so. I have been an advocate for our police department and our fire department since day one, and I will continue to do that. Thank you. So where's when I got on the council, I was surprised to hear that the city of Orange had not hired new police cops, a police officer since 2002. That's 20 years ago. It's 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the population of Orange was 103,000. They're estimating by the census that we're going to be up to 160 um, by the next census. And you still have the same amount of police officers. Does that seem right? No. So the, this council came forward with my recommendation to hire five new cops and then to unfreeze nine new positions. That's 14 new bodies on the street. You know what's sad? It's not enough. We need a lot more. How many times have you guys driven uh, past your neighborhoods and there's a homeless person there? Or there's somebody who unfortunately had a bad night the night before. And we have to call on police officers. I am proud. To support our police officers, that's why they've endorsed me and our city fire department. <clears throat> so there's so you're a candidate in the district as you acknowledge both of you acknowledge that it's undergoing change. What are your priorities for district three? And what is your vision for the North Texas specific? Well, I'll start with the North Texas Pacific plan since we're gonna have an ad hoc committee and I invite all of you guys to go by the invitations on our city website. For 30 years, this place has been getting worse. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm scared to use the word blight with you, but we're living with blight in the city of Orange. And something needs to be done. The property owners have been last, and they've been left alone with nobody telling them to clean up their mess. And they need to be brought to account. If you want to be part of this city, and if you want to own the jewel of the third district, which is over here from all of Orange, you guys need to shape up. And if you don't want to, sell your property. Is the bottom line. I am sick and tired of driving down Chestnut Avenue and seeing drug paraphernalia outside the streets. Does that seem right? Are we living in San Francisco? No, we're living in Orange. So that's my priority there. That's my number one priority is the Mall of Orange. I'm sick and tired of seeing it, and I hope you guys are too. And I hope you come in and so the property owners can hear you on how sick you are that they've done this source of And the two is when you're driving down the third district, I think, look, most of the third district is close to four. So you're going to see a lot of the retaining walls, a lot of graffiti, walls that don't match, streets that haven't been paved. It's, it's just tired. And I talk about this with some of my colleagues. District 3, District 1, District 2, that's the old part of Orange. Orange is not just District 5 and 6. We need to take care of all of our neighborhoods. That's what Orange is for. And we need to make sure that we don't forget every single resident. Okay. So we're so. Thank you. Um, my top top priorities for the Orange Mall is right now, I'll tell you, um, we are not looking to rezone, but we are looking to revitalize. And there is a difference between those two. Bringing back the Orange Mall to what it was, making it a, an area for people to come, it is an area that we can increase our revenue here in the city. The North Tustin specific plan was canceled by a unanimous vote of the city council. And I'm going to continue to work with the residents to make sure that the Orange Mall, as I know it, I know it's called the Village in Orange, 
Um, but the orange ball is taken care of and revitalized. Once you rezone commercial or open space for housing, you can never get that back. I don't know if my friend Kathy has made that same pledge that I have, but I've pledged not to take money from developers, which will help in re revitalizing that area. I've also pledged not to rezone that area, the entire Tustin Court. It's, in, it's important that we make sure that the Orange Mall is pushed forward by the ideas of the residents, not by developers. And it's important to work with the landlords to make sure we can make something happen. There are 20 acres of just parking on that property. So the, the sky is the limit with that area, and we can make it something fantastic for the third district. The general plan is the Bible, if you will say, for planning in Orange and for all municipalities. Our general plan has not been reviewed for many, many years, and it is time that it is, that it is done so. So that is another priority, is reviewing our general plan, making sure that the Orange Mall is revitalized responsibly, and making sure that the 3rd District is well taken care of in terms of safety. Um, I would also like to see the power lines <coughs> put under wrap in front of the Orange Mall and throughout the 3rd District. Finally, for the 3rd District as your representative, thank you. So I'm going to follow with both of you because you both articulated augmentation, expansion, acquisitions, uh, growing agencies, and so on and so forth. So I'm curious on both of you, we'll go to you, what would you view as the source of funding to be able to deliver these kinds of results and services at the level of services? Well, it's come back to Megan, doesn't it? Um, because we canceled the North Mississippi plan, we canceled the grant that came with it. But you know what? Good riddance. Because that's the last thing I'm going to do is being told from the state what to do on that property. Um, I think that there's some creative ways, but frankly, that really goes back to the property owners, Daddy. If they don't want to be here and if they're not committed, then we can sell it. Thank you. Um, in Orange, we can become more business friendly. We need to increase our revenue sources by streamlining our startup process. As a business, if I were a business owner, which I am, I own my own small business as a uh, realtor. But if I were a business owner with a storefront property, I would not want to go over to the Orange Mall because I'm not sure about the zoning. If I'm unsure about the zoning in the Orange Mall, I don't want to start my business over there, which could be rezoned and my business is out. If we are ensuring business owners that our zoning is secure and stable, we can entice business owners to come and open up in the city of Orange, the Orange Mall, streamline startup processes, and increase our revenue. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's have some fun. We're going to do a lightning round here. We're going to start with Ms. Calaveras, and then Ms. Marissa, you'll answer the same. Uh, so let's start with the favorite all time job. Um, I got to drive around George W. Bush in Philadelphia when he was uh, on his way to get the Republic nomination and I was hit with tomatoes. So <laughs> 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 um, I think, well, it's not as cool as that. I, <laughs> I think it's cool. I'll give you that one. Uh, my favorite job has been working with the youth at Holy Family, coaching them in um, volleyball and basketball. I'm working with the youth over there in Orange, watching these kids grow, and it's, it's really been heartwarming. That's, I think, been my favorite job, too. It's so, the most memorable place you've ever visited. Oh, my goodness. Um, gosh. Um, Boston. I went to Boston this summer, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I'd love to say Orange, but I like that. Which <laughs> <laughs> is that worse? Um, I would have to say Bradley Field, a.k.a. Kevin. Um, Favorite <laughs> subject in school, Ms. Edwards? Oh, history. I love talking about it. <laughs> it's a Russo. Uh, mine has to be biology. It's a Russo favorite day of the week. Uh, it's, well, every day is Monday, but uh, it has to be Friday. <laughs> Sunday. So, where's your favorite spot in Orange? Well, it no longer exists, but it was lost since for many years. Memories uh, going there. And that day was, uh, I know this sounds weird, but that's the day that I brought to the Blossoms. I'll always remember that. So, uh, I'm getting a couple tears with Councilwoman Barrios on that one. Okay. So, I'd have to say Paul's place. 
I know my family would be over there all the time for, for Mother's Day, for Valentine's oh Day. Uh, but it has to be Paul's face. So we're so favorite world leader. Oh man, favorite world leader. Um, I would have to say President Kennedy. Um, I would have to say Winston Churchill because he saved my parents' life. Okay. So, where's favorite American state besides California? Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry, we're not sure. Um, I would say, for the beauty of it all, I think Virginia is one of the most beautiful states. I see. So, Russo, I'd have to say Tennessee. It's really, really beautiful. Great. Now you have the opportunity for one minute. Closing statement, and Ms. Tyler-Harris, we'll go with you. I hope I can earn your vote on election day um, and continue my service on the city council. Um, I have, have a, I have a proven record now of 17 months, 18 months, and I have life, work, and work experiences. I have 30 years of proven work experience managing over again hundreds of employees and large million dollar budgets. Since 2007, I've had my own business here in the city of Orange um, while being a primary caretaker for my own parents. I have delivered results in the last 18 months, and I expect to keep delivering for the city of Orange for the next two years to, for the remainder of this term on District 3. Um, with my vast experience, my maturity, and my love for my hometown, I will do my pot with a positive attitude, do everything I can that is based on facts and not fluff, and with respect to my colleagues, our residents, and business owners, not based on gossip, innuendo, or immaturity. Owning your own story is the greatest thing you can do. And I am a very proud person, and I'm very proud of my story. I have a coherent and well-informed governing philosophy on time. And many years of relevant experience. Thank you very much. So, Rizzo, first I'd like to thank the Chamber for hosting this forum. I'm running for City Council because I believe Orange deserves proactive leadership that knows how to best serve the community. I will put the voices of the residents first. I'm committed to driving positive and responsible change in the most importantly, restoring trust in our city council. And that's why I went to court in 2020 to protect our term limit ordinance. While I was successful in court, the city was not successful. We ended up with an appointee rather than asking the city who our representative should be. If your priorities include your elected leaders maintaining a balanced budget, and that Orange is business friendly, with a safe community and fully supported first responders, then I need your vote. I'm proud to have earned the endorsement of Dan Slater and have pledged not to take money from developers. It is time that the residents' voices are not only heard, but answered. I'm your past, present, and with your vote, your future. Please vote John Russo for Orange City Council District. Thank you. Let's thank the candidates for this. For a moment, I believe there are some students here from Rancho San Diego College who are here. Have joined us. Where are you, students? There they are. The students here on campus who are on. <laughs> <laughs> for District Four. Mr. Dennis Bodo, Chris Horton, and the third candidate. In case you're wondering, declined to participate in tonight's town hall. So we have two candidates. Or Mr. Bilder, Mr. Horton. Gentlemen, in alphabetical order, we'll lead off with a one open statement, Mr. Bilder. Good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Dennis Bilder, and I'm a 31 year resident of one which makes me rather new. Uh, my wife and I uh, uh, moved here shortly after. Actually, I moved here first, and then we were married in uh, 1991. Um, we have, uh, we're blessed with three children. Uh, and I'm soon to be an empty nester in about nine months. Um, uh, my two older children have launched. Uh, my children now go to all the local schools. It's uh, Serrano and Serrano in Phillip Park. Um, I previously served on the city council, uh, and I was elected 16 years ago. I served for eight years, and it was time to go. And I took an acre break. So I would like to come back and, and serve again. Um, I believe I have a lot to offer. Uh, given my background, my technical background, I'm a licensed traffic civil engineer. Um, I have no learning curve in terms of serving on council. I understand land development very well. Uh, professionally, I'm the county traffic engineer for the county of Orange. Thank you. 
Mr. Horn. I want to first thank the Orange Chamber of Commerce for holding this candidate's forum tonight and as well. Thank you for moderating. I was born and raised in the city of Orange. Uh, my family's been here since 1944, so that leads me a third generation for the Orange. My wife, Jeanette, and I have raised two boys here in the city of Orange, as well as establishing, owning, and operating our own small business for the past 20 years. I've also been volunteering in the city of Orange for 20 years uh, through the Orange Chamber of Commerce and other nonprofits. Last year, I was appointed to the Orange County Workforce Development Board, where I work in 32 cities and we help business owners hire and train new employees including veterans i'm ready for city council because our city needs change i want to help be that change yes i ran 2010 who uh, was the incumbent and I did the third vote. <laughs> Mr. Bilodeau, first question to you so housing affordability continues to be a problem across california including a great city. So what role do you see for the city in addressing the issue of housing affordability? What are we doing about Well, uh, as you know, Ambassador, uh, the Southern California Association of Governments uh, comes up with the numbers that we are uh, sort of mandated to meet, and uh, they're called the reading numbers, the regional housing, uh, regional housing assessment numbers. And uh, I'm glad to say that Orange has actually met their burden which has uh, worked with the private development community to build a number of uh, affordable housing projects. Uh, there's always pressure to build more, and uh, our city's getting very built out. And as you try to build more, that's when you come into conflict with the existing neighborhoods. So we have to be very careful in where we locate these projects, being sensitive to the neighbors. Um, <laughs> but uh, or to really the shape that I'm trying to provide for. Uh, um, to the actions of the city council. Uh, yes, um, Orange is at a level where we do have to get more affordable housing right now. Although we do have developers that continue to try to develop in our open space, um, we just need to make sure that we keep our open, open space. We don't overdevelop because our infrastructure right now cannot, cannot take more. High density apartment buildings being built on the North Tustin uh, Street area, and um, I will vote against that all day long. Um, we don't need it, like I said, our infrastructure can't handle it, the streets can't handle it, the schools certainly uh, cannot handle that. So, as a follow up to that question, the, the absence of a couple of candidates has given us a little extra time. So, as a follow up to what you both just articulated, are we managing the density of the city in a responsible way? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes and no. Um, when I was on the council, um, I supported uh, single point of home projects. I actually voted no. I was one or two uh, uh, multi unit projects that I felt were inappropriate for the neighborhood. Um, I think the council has to be very careful when it comes to. Uh, Density projects and making sure that uh, the neighbors are heard and uh, impacts are mitigated. It's very important. Um, Sacramento has promulgated rules now that it's going to take the ability of the council to even uh, uh, mitigate these projects away from us. They're going to allow I guess to possibly make commercial zone areas, whether you like it or not. So the council has to get ahead of this and work with the development community. Try its best to mitigate projects um, if possible. Mr. Horton? Um, yes, I agree. The state will eventually try to take this out of our hands, and this is when we as a city council will stand up against it and, and vote no every single time. Um, I believe that as a city council, it's our decision which developments get built and which ones don't. Um, I think right now, again, kind of going back to the high density uh, aspect of it and our infrastructure, our schools. I've spoken knocking doors, knocking many doors over these past couple weeks, speaking to people, even speaking with the, uh, to people that work for the school district. Um, 
they told me that it is a bad, bad idea and our schools are overflowing as it is right now. And we just, we just can't uh, handle that. So yeah, it's up to the city council to be very careful about um, building new more projects in the city of Orange. Mr. Wharton, if you get elected, what would be the, the top priorities for you as a member of the city council to the San Congress of the city? First of all, we need to fix the permit process in City Hall. It's broken right now. I've been speaking to new business owners, and in fact, I spoke before today, and they've waited over a year to get a permit to uh, help their project along. So we need to um, fix that. As we all know, small business is the lifeblood of our city, so we need to continue to uh, go out and where you try to find businesses to come into the city of I think uh, right now we're, we're missing huge opportunities. Uh, we do not have, the city doesn't have an economic development manager. Uh, that's their sole job. I know we have an interim, but they're also, their main job is assistant city manager. So we need to hire an economic development manager that will help with this. I think also partnering with the Chamber of Commerce and their economic development committee uh, to help with business retention. I think that's, that's, uh, we really need to, uh, work on that. Mr. Lugo? Yes, um, I think Mr. Horton brings up some great points. Um, the city did lose its economic development director, uh, Lisa came to the city of Garden Grove to go away. Um, and we do need to fill that position with a full-time person. Um, one thing I'd like to explore is eliminating the Business license for home based businesses. I don't think it's necessary. Um, the city really needs to focus on uh, increasing sales tax revenue. A big portion of the revenue the city uh, uh, gets currently is from the sale of gasoline. As you can imagine, that gasoline sales are going to peak. You know, the next 10 years are going to be on the decline. Well, the city better prepare for that now. It needs to uh, recruit or retain. Or sales tax for some businesses, which places in the village of Orange Mall, which I don't know if you walked through there recently, like I said, there's not a lot, a lot of activity going on there. Um, and the city needs to uh, meet with the mall owner and, of course, with the neighbors and come up with a game plan, which we talked about Costco for years. I went to conferences to try to work Costco to come here. Got a lot of council years ago, and more successful. But now that Sears is gone, now that Jason Pennies is gone, we have to get ahead of that, and we have to aggressively recruit uh, businesses to come to the mortgage because of our sales tax is declining. Mr. Miller, uh, what, what makes Orange unique amongst the 34 cities of Orange County? And if elected, what would you do to preserve and protect the commerce, lifestyle, and history of the city? I know that's a lot, but what would you do? Well, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is, is our old town, which when I, everywhere I go, the first thing people say is, I love your old town. And uh, the Old Town Preservation Association has done a great job in uh, making sure that the old structures are maintained, uh, period, correct. Um, and the city spends a lot of resources to maintain the town. Uh, the sidewalks are staying open on Sunday night. And uh, uh, because we had a lot of foot traffic there. Um, Orange is unique, though, in that. Uh, we don't have any extra taxes. We don't have a utility users tax. Many cities do. We don't have a franchise fee on our trash hauler. I think every other city in Orange County does. We don't have that here. Um, Orange has been able to live within its means. And uh, that's, I think, a great service to the city council on their own fashion budget that protects our public safety and maintains our parks and uh, maintains our own tenant shop. Sure. Um, I agree that um, we have lived within our means. Um, and when I ran for city council back in, in 2010, we were just coming out of the recession. That was a really hard time. Um, you know, we were on the city council, we did a couple where we did cut. Um, so, yeah, because of that, we are able to afford um, to release. Sorry, yeah. Um, but, yeah, we need to preserve both. But for what it is, and, and but it goes past that. It 
who's outside of Old Town? So you can remark this one outside of Old Town that I've been knocking on doors and people aren't happy about the look of things, North Custom Street. Um, it's getting old. It needs it needs a facelift, it needs a big facelift. So when we talk about the city of Old March, it's just not Old Town. I live in District 4. I've been in District 4 for 26 years and I love my district. I do. We have um, great schools, um, love my neighborhood. So we, when we talk about it, we need to look uh, beyond the numbers. So, so Sorkin, uh, we'll leave with you on this, this question. So, in terms of personal style methodology, and this will get to both of you, but we'll leave with you. It's what kind of strategy or methods you, would you envision using to identify? The work on key issues in this in this uh, in the district, uh, in reaching out to constituencies on issues affecting the district. What, what is your your model for inclusion of constituencies and citizens participating in public processes? Um, to reach out to them, yeah. Um, we have to listen to the citizens at large. We cannot, as city council members, sit up there and tell the citizens what needs to be done. We need to reach out. We need to talk to them. We need to let our residents and our business owners have a voice on it. Um, not once has anybody ever knocked on my door that has run for a political office in the city of Orange. And I am knocking, going to knock every single door twice with help of candidacy teams to talk to everybody. I want to know what's on their mind. I want to know what their issues are. I want to help them at city council. I want to take their vision of the city council and help them fix things. Well, um, when I was faced with projects at City Hall, first thing I do is I read all the technical studies. I, I try to consume all of the studies that are available from the staff, the staff reports. And I always meet with the uh, applicants, but I also meet the neighbors. And those that might be opposed to whatever the application might be. Um, I'm fairly direct with people, maybe too direct at times. In terms of um, how I view the world on things. Um, and uh, there was a few things that I dealt with in the city where um, I lost the vote, where it was a 4 1 or a 3 2 against me. And um, I don't have any regrets in anything I voted no on uh, because I know I had to look at myself. And four years goes by like that. So um, I'll always be direct and accessible to uh, the neighbors. Uh, my cell phone numbers on my website. I'm getting a lot of phone calls from somebody <laughs> getting a lot of input. And um, uh, I think it's important that everyone is heard at City Hall and um, everyone's opinion is considered. Thank you. Let's have some fun now. This is a lightning round. We'll ask some questions of you so we get to know you a little bit better. And uh, Ms. Horton, we're going to lead off with you. Favorite freeway. <laughs> Couldn't resist that one. Big five, right? Big five. You can always count on traffic. <laughs> well, I can hear the 55 from my bedroom window, but uh, I, I like driving down the freeway. So, favorite car that you own or possess? Oh, well, it's the car I drove this evening. Uh, my 67 Camaro, which I heard my mother bought earlier. <laughs> <laughs> a 1928 Ford Model A. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Just, uh, about <laughs> Some sound <time>, right. Mr. <laughs> so, Horton, do you have a favorite national park? Um, Grand Canyon is beautiful. Grand Canyon. Let's go, go. You know, I like uh, I like going to see the Quick Quick Mountains in Colorado. It's my favorite. Favorite food? This is really it's real good. Oh, favorite food? My favorite food is Mexican food. <laughs> All day long. Short. Waffles. Short and texting or talking? Talking. Talking. Short. Uh, I like talking, but I find that it's pretty good. My children's texting. <laughs> and who are your favorite band? Oh, my favorite band? 
Well, I just went and saw part of my favorite band, which is a band, Peter Hook, a side of a concert last week. Uh, he was the uh, bassist guitarist for a band called Joy Division, which is a band from my childhood, my teenage years. It's Gordon. I love the former Elton John. And this order, your favorite world leader. You know, we have to be President Zelensky. Uh, Mr. Willard, your favorite amusement park? Well, I have to say now it's very fun because my wife has worked for 29 years. I'm saying it's different, I think there'd be a lot of trouble there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Horton. Um, I have to say Disneyland. Main Street Life School, great, right? <laughs> With that, we'll go to closing uh, remarks and we'll leave Ms. Villadell for one minute. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you to the Chamber for hosting us. Um, what I have to offer is a lifetime of experience and service. I've served previously on the City Council for eight years. I served on the Planning Commission. I've served on the board of the Orange County Transportation Authority as a public member. I've served on the board of the Transportation Corridor Agencies, the Orange County Sanitation District, uh, the Venture Control District. And uh, the, the real love of my life, which is the Orange County Water District. Um, I think that uh, public service is a, is a political profession. Um, I really enjoy growing up on stage at City Hall and helping, and trying to be part of the solution uh, to give us all a better quality of life. And I would appreciate your vote, uh, if you please. And uh, you can find out more about me at dennisbelow.com. Mr. This candidate's forum was a prelude into what this election will be about. It will be about electing the past or electing the future. The future that has a new generation of leadership that our city needs to move forward. And I am part of that future. Leadership that will work with the people and for the people instead of against them. Leadership that will listen to the people and not shut them down. True leadership that will sit in the city council groups council for the sole purpose of bettering our city. Leadership that can create positive change that our residents and business owners are desperate for. As a city, we need to bring in more business because business is the lifeblood of any city. My name is Chris Horton. I'm running for city council in District 4. I'd be honored to receive your vote. And you can learn more about me at votehorton.com. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Kenny. I'm not going to 
service on the planning commission for eight years and design review committee for four and a half. Um, bottom line is I am prepared. I know what I'm doing and we'll talk a lot about the issues in district six going forward um, as we go through this discussion, but I appreciate your vote on November 8th. Mr. Gillenhammer. Good evening everyone. My name is John Gillenhammer. I just wanted to start by saying thank you to the college, yeah, to you, uh, and to everyone here for coming. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm married, I have two young kids, and I have lived in the district uh, for the last six years. I plan on living in one for the rest of my life. The last 15 years, I've worked in the private sector as a retail operations manager. Currently, I'm a regional director for Amazon, and I run sites in Southern California. Um, I, during this time, in these last 15 years, I've led large teams and large organizations, and I've and supervising significant budgets. Um, I've also had the opportunity during that time to be, be engaged in a lot of different avenues of volunteerism. I've been on the board of the United Ways of California. I've had partnerships with uh, Special Olympics, um, and a lot of my sites have helped shop with the cop events. Um, thank you all. <laughs> Mr. Henry. Good evening. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce myself and ask for your vote. I'm Brian Harrington. I'm your neighbor. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I'm an engineer and a supply chain professional. I'm a little league manager and an amateur paid soccer, uh, soccer coach. My wife and I chose our eight years ago when we it was time to start our family. The promise and the comfort of our city was unmatched then. It's my mission to ensure that our will continue to thrive as our forever home. A place for our kids will look to also when it's time for them to start their families. I want to see more and better parks, trees, bike lanes. Let's get doubly serious about our water resources and our environment. Let's build a stronger, safer community of tolerance and diversity with sensible development and accessibility. Your city council must work for you in big things and small. I will be the person you can call to a street light or a park needs attention. I will also be the person you can count on when it comes to development. Development has to make sense. 140,000 of us share 26 square miles. Our neighborhoods range from high density to rural. World. Let's welcome new neighbors and ways to fit within our community. I'm Brian Harrington and I'm looking for your help. I gave them a little bit of a new way there on the back end when the time was learning. 
Thank you. 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 Well, the first and foremost thing to do is explain the process thoroughly to everybody involved, whether it's a contractor or a resident that is pulling a permit. Um, all the tools that we can have available to everybody to learn the process is the best, the best approach, um, the best strategy. Um, most of the time, folks don't know if they need a permit or if they need a process to go through. So the education toolkit is the most important thing. Um, obviously, we have our 24-7 app that has some functions in there that we can certainly utilize um, to make it much more business-friendly. Um, the reality is opening a business, if you've never opened one, is pretty confusing. So if you need some assistance, we can do some economic development options, both with the chamber as well as the city, to make it easier for you to get your business more and head back. Mr. Gillen, Yeah, the permitting process can be um, confusing and it can take um, a lot of time and, and money. For me, uh, it is about education. It is about making sure that everyone has, understands where to go and find how to start this process. I think it's also about streamlining it. So making sure that any obstruction that can stop or get in the way of the permitting process is sped up and allows uh, individuals not only to know, but also to step in and uh, speed up the process as much as possible. Um, in terms of fees and in terms of uh, the amount of money for uh, elements of the permitting process, I would love to look through what that looks like um, and find ways to reduce those uh, so that individuals have a speedier, uh, less costly uh, avenue to achieving the purpose of the report. Mr. Hurd? It's an interesting question. Um, if you look at how City of Orange attracts businesses, I think we think too small. Uh, I've been part of siting committees at very different, at several different companies where we're looking at locations to build facilities. And I can tell you that the Soto County, Mississippi, Costa Rica, Enterprise Ireland, these are the gold standards for organizations and, and uh, political groups that work with business to find sites. We don't have anything like that here in Orange. We absolutely need it. The things we want to do in our city take money, and money comes from taxes, and taxes come from businesses coming to our, our, to our, to our city. Excuse me. Small business is wonderful, and we need to continue to be a place where small business can thrive. We need to start attracting some big companies to launch. Okay. Mr. Gillen Hammer, like the rest of Orange County, Orange is evolving as our city becomes more diverse in every sense of the world. So what would you do if elected as a council member to create an inclusive environment for citizens to participate in community and civic activities? I think when we look about look at the different um, opportunities to engage individuals, I think we have to uh, look at avenues and celebrations to make sure that we're engaging all members of our community. So throughout the year, as Orange celebrates our traditions, Continue to look at those, engage, and bring more into how the old town feel uh, that we have. Continues to look at uh, the growing and differences in our population going forward. How do we continue to build and engage additional traditions to bring our citizens together? Um, from a communication standpoint, uh, for city council meetings or any way uh, citizens want to engage, um, I think it's important to make sure that accessibility, uh, both in terms of language and technology, I would work to make sure that we're actively bringing that to all members of the community. I think generally speaking, having open forums and avenues to engage uh, and bring people uh, to the conversation, I think is something we need to be doing from an outreach standpoint as well. Mr. Hermanson. Conclusion is a very interesting question. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about our city is the focus on the jewel of our city, the whole town. Uh, however, the city does not stop at Tustin Avenue. We're here in the East Orange District. 
Why is this in council meetings? We have to give it use for council meetings. Why aren't they happening in other districts of the city? Um, the parks in East Orange are too small and too few. We need more. When we get some more parks, maybe we can have some more celebrations. And in terms of inclusion, in terms of accessibility, our city needs to be a model. All cultures are welcome. All people are welcome. Yes, inclusion is one of the complaints that's often been rendered about our city in terms of the, the past couple of years. Um, there have been a lot of folks who express that they've been left out and don't feel like they belong. And I think we need to make extra effort to include those folks at the table, um, open up our process, open up transparency and decision making, include everybody in the conversation. Um, I'll be blunt. Much of what we do is, is often focused on an ideolo ideology perspective, and if you are different from that, you often are dismissed, and we need to stop doing that. We need to open our options for all voices to be heard at City Hall, all voices to be participatory in terms of process. Um, our City Council meets once a month. They should meet more frequently. Our Council should have town halls. We should be involved in listening to what you want. Um, and we'll talk a bit further, but we have a lot of neighborhoods in our city right now that are really angry that they have been left out of the conversation. And we have to change that. We have to go forward. And on the council, I will do that um, from day one and, and move our city forward and have folks who feel like they've been left out included. And whether they're um, new to Orange, have not grown up here, or whether they've been here for a long time, or what their background is. Everyone, everyone, all should feel like they belong at all. Mr. Harrington, this question is to you. As a city council member, you are one of six council members plus the mayor. If elected, how would you build consensus and collaboration with your colleagues to achieve positive outcomes for District 6, and at the same time, achieving goals for the city at large? Yeah, thank you for the question. Consensus is something that comes from building bridges with people. And it's far too easy to just build bridges with people that are already here. The trick, the trick, the game, the job is to build bridges with people that don't necessarily agree with you. And you do that by finding basic principles and basic facts that you can agree on and build out from there. If we can't agree that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, we're going to have some trouble. Most of us can agree there and start from there. Uh, we have to be trustworthy with each other. We have to fulfill our promises. And not just to each other on the city council, but also to the residents of the city. And that's one of the things where you see where the city council really has a black mark against it in terms of keeping promises that have been made to the city and specifically keeping promises that have been made to the city. Mr. Yeah, building consensus is really having a in depth conversation with all members of the council, all seven. And let's just be also clear that every member of the council the mayor has one vote. One vote. So the discussion should be consistent with everybody discussing the issues in front of us, in front of us in the public. We need to look at those decisions in real time, in front of cameras, on how decisions are made. And I'll give you a little bit of my philosophy. Oftentimes there's a political bucket for a decision, and there's a policy bucket and a planning bucket. And if you stay in the planning and the policy bucket, usually you can reach consensus. It's that political bucket where it ends up becoming personal, needs parity, favoritism, all of those issues which do not build consensus. And we need to fix that. And I'm, as a member of the council, that will be my priority, those two buckets. I think consensus building starts when we look at somebody with the God-given value that they have. Um, everyone is invaluable and they can be treated with utmost level of respect. Um, once you have that level of respect and understanding, then I think it starts with earning trust and connecting um, and explaining why you do what you do. Um, and I think when we look at that, it's about um, discussing issues separate from how we personally feel. So we need to have an open dialogue to be able to discuss differences, and at the end of the day, vote our heart and our conviction and what we believe is the, in the best for the city. 
I think the other component of this is really being a student and educating myself, educating ourselves on what's important to the entire city, not just the district that we live in. Um, and understanding that we're there to serve all residents of Orange, not just our own district. Um, so I think the open dialogue starts with treating everybody with their God given value that they have, um, and then being honest and transparent about the whys, and then trying to discuss the issues uh, without making it personal. So that's an next question to you. So while every section of the city is an integral part of our community, District 6 is unique uh, in that it borders considerable open space, a unique mix of housing, and is home to the oldest regional park in Orange County. What do you see as the challenges and opportunities of District 6? Okay. Well, the challenges in District 6 are all centered around proper planning and proper planning decision making. Um, this area has had to, had to endure three referendums uh, since early 2000. We can't do that anymore. We can't put our community through that kind of that kind of challenge. Decisions need to be made that are in the best interest of this of the city as well as these success. Um, my background in planning, I'm a planning nerd. I understand what needs to be done correctly. If an environmental document is flawed, I'm going to speak up and say so. The Charles de Santiago project, the Charles de Santiago Hills project should never have been approved in 2019. It did not have a proper EIR. And likewise, we know we've got this, the project that's now going to move forward with their mind. You need me on the council to make sure that that project gets delivered as approved. Because I know the details, I know what's involved, and I'll give the oversight to that process. Those are the two big projects that we have to face. And we do have the balance of open space in our city, and we all know that we are woefully deficient. And um, that's a that's an unfortunate thing that our city is strapped with. And going forward, we're going to have to challenge ourselves on how to fix it. Um, that is my expertise, and that is why I want to bring that balance in the council. Yeah, one of the biggest issues facing District Six, six is uh, this component of open space and a need to continue. Um, in a healthy city. I moved to District 6 six years ago because I love the feeling where we're at. All the parks, the openness, um, is absolutely something that's a priority to preserve that open space in our parks. Um, as we look at uh, the future and the growth of our city, how, how do we balance out a need to, to grow to be financially healthy while still preserving that open space in those parks? In District 6, we have uh, your bank company building uh, soon. Their that property is entitled. How do we stay uh, close to it? How do we be a great partner for uh, for the company that's building, but a great partner for our residents to make sure that we're addressing the concerns of development? And then one of the other big issues in the district is the Sully Miller property. The Sully Miller property, I fully support and want that to be preserved open space parks for us. I got two kids. I got a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. I run Peters Canyon. I take my kids to the park all the time. That would be a phenomenal place to get a sports park, a park, or just preserve it in general. Um, District 6 is a beautiful part of the city, um, and our main issues are going to be around how do we continue to allow for uh, appropriate growth while protecting our open space and our parks. If I knew three candidates that pretty much think very much alike on selling the building property and power of space in our area. Uh, one of the things that we also need to preserve is our culture, of course, and property, and all the different uh, things that go into that. Um, when you think about District 6, it's almost like where the city of Orange becomes the Old West. I think we need to preserve that and find ways to preserve that. The open space that we have is largely undeveloped. Parks that we, the best parks in, in District 6 are kind of parks. Uh, I'd like to see more City of Orange parks in our district and um, you know, definitely taking advantage of the Old West field that we have here in District 6. So, I want to go to discuss something and question with regard to how we, how you would as a city council person, promote and or advance the relationships 
the bordering cities, the border city of Orange. When you step back and look at the map of Orange, you realize that we probably intersect with more cities than most jurisdictions in Orange County. As a council person, is, is it important to maintain relationships with those municipalities? How would you execute those relationships? Well, Ambassador, it is imperative that we that we have a relationship with those adjacent cities. And, and I will tell you, I have friends and, that are elected in those decisions and those cities that do not feel that they're connected to our joint town. So we have to bridge that gap. We have to reach out to Santa Ana, Anaheim, Tuscan, um, Bill Park, Bill Parks, we're surrounded by Bill Park. We, we do need to engage and work with them um, and find common areas where we can work together on things. It's imperative. That we do that, and, and the best approach probably is just going to be talking, getting together frequently, having conversation, um, issues that are shared that we can navigate together. Um, we know that Santa Ana is part four, so so is Garden Grove, and maybe we can look at some shared options with funding for different things that we're both working on to come up with mutual mutual support. I'm a big fan of. Of public public partnerships on things, particularly when we're dealing with open space and acquisition with open space. The reason why is because it's all transparently known. All of the process, all the deal is connected, so we can look at some of those options. Um, you know, I've been I've been working in government. I've been working in planning, and it's a common kind of perception that Orange is a little bit, a little bit. Uh, I'm trying to think of the correct word. We've been a little bit inward in our viewpoint, and that's probably because of our German heritage and part of our stubbornness and stuff. So those are things we need to obviously get up to speed because it's 2022. And as you said with the other question, we have a very diverse county and a very different thinking county than maybe even we are in large. So I would do all of the above. Sure. Yeah, I mean, look, the city of Orange is not isolated. Right? We have uh, uh, cities around us, we can surround the city of Little Park. Um, I think the models are already there. If you look at how our fire department integrates with the other fire departments and surrounding communities, there's a model there to, to, to be followed. I love, I love what Adrian was saying about parks. I think that's something we can look at. We already have that with some of the county parks that are in our area. Um, Orange certainly is standoffish to some of the other cities. And I think with, certainly with where we are even on the map, we're the crossroads, we're the central pivot point of all of the cities north and south, east and west of the city of Orange County. And I think we can rise to that and be the leader for the county, certainly for this part of the county, and uh, you know, drive it this way. I think it's incredibly important that we stay connected to the cities surrounding us and to county partners that are county allies throughout uh, the city of Orange. Um, I think if you start with uh, public safety, uh, the partnerships that we have with sheriffs and, and local police to support one another, uh, given incidents that may require additional support or repair. And our police and our fire have fantastic relationships with the local organizations, um, and they leverage each other when support is needed. Uh, and I has a helicopter. Uh, we need that periodically. Um, wildfires happen uh, in multiple different cities. Our our firefighters don't support local uh, local cities to support uh, if those happen as well. I think public safety partnerships are incredibly important, and that's why we should really stay connected to local cities. Um, I think decisions that are being made on our borders can impact traffic, can impact crime. Uh, so I think understanding. Um, and, and aligning with some of these decisions over time are going to be important for us from a preparedness standpoint. Um, and there's utilities that cross over, so better understand it as well. One of the cool things that is in place is that there's an association of city council members that um, they meet up with regularly to share broader issues. Uh, that's something I've been to, that's something I've connected with multiple city council members just to start to build the relationships that are going to be required. And then lastly, in those county islands, Little Park is a beautiful place. Um, I've had a chance to go to the Rotary Club meetings, and it's a place where you know, we can continue to, and where I want to continue to uh, volunteer and be a part of organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Let's have some fun. So that's what we're going to begin with you, your favorite movie of all time. Favorite movie of all time, well, Color Purple. Real Hammer? The Greatest Showman. Yeah, Sir Hammer's up. Flashboard. So we do, Mr. Harrington. Favorite musical artist? Pure. Real Hammer? Uh, country Blue Combs right now? And Did you say favorite musical music artist? Musician, musical, oh, musician yeah. musical. Yeah, musical arts. Okay, I'm I'm jazz, so anything jazz. Okay. <laughs> Skill and Hammer first car. Uh, 1973 Jaguar XJ6 Chevy conversion 350. I went to my dad. I had it in high school. I picked up another one and sold it for a Ah, first car, Ford Mustang, purchased from Villa Ford in Orange. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with a check that my dad made me fill out, I still have a copy of it, $5,800. Kept it for 22 years. I've only owned three cars. That tells you how fiscally tight I am. six <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite Broadway musical? Hamilton. Uh, I watched it on Disney Plus and I really want to see it live. It's funny, Mark's got it. So, hey, Mr. Hermitage. The only thing I can tell is Pippin. Music man. So, I have some favorite place in Orange. There's so many, but I will have to say the plaza. Oh man, um, Peter's Canyon Regional Park. I run out of time. Sure, Peter's Canyon. Sure, your favorite president of the United States. No fun. Still him. George Washington uh, reluctant to take role, will he step down um, and set the tone? The mind's Abraham Lincoln. Sure, your favorite author. Uh, Outside of Well, Grisham, probably all the Grisham novels, particularly the farm. Mr. Bill Hammer? Uh, well, the only book I'm really reading is the Bible right now. Mr. Bill Hammer, last book read. Maybe you just answered that. Uh, the book of Matthew, I'm in a small group and we're reading four chapters a week, so we're reading that. Sir, Dark Star Safari. Mr. Bledson? Crossroads by Cal Thomas and Bob Beckel, two seasoned newspaper writers, two different sides of the aisle, talking about how we can bridge the conflict between the two sides. Great. Let's give our thanks to the guests. Thank you most sincerely for the opportunity to get back to our city. Thank you for your interest in your commitment to civic involvement. Being able to hear us is so important. I'm so blessed and honored to be here tonight. Uh, we're all in this together. It's time to move beyond skepticism and face the fact that our future will be hotter and drier than the last 135 years, the first 135 years of our city. Now is the time to plant the trees to build a resilient city for our next 135 years. We want to agree on everything, but it's my promise to you that you've been heard with respect due to every resident of our city. We need more housing. We also need more tax-paying businesses. We have some of the greatest hospitals in the world as well as world-class universities. Let's partner with these engines of innovation and build incubators for our future. Let's also be a model for decorum, community, material support, and appreciation. We're all in this together. I'm Brian Harrington, please welcome me to the Council of Districts. Thank you. Mr. Lassen. Uh, thank you for all of the folks that put this together, um, particularly the Chamber and also the Santiago Canyon College, we have trustee in front. Um, thank you so much for all this opportunity. My website will tell you all that you want to know about me at adrianforrance.com. It didn't get answered here. Um, but bottom line, I bring my 40 years of experience and city planning expertise to the City Council, and that balance will give what to uh, 
um, to finish the work of the development that's going to be here in East Orange, particularly with Irvine Company. Um, but my background on the Planning Commission and the Design Review Committee really is, is the most important issue that we need to deal with in terms of the future. It's either we're going to properly plan our city or we're not. Are we going to face more referendums? Are we going to face more legal challenges? Or are we going to start listening to the community on the issues that we care about, which is open space and protecting our neighborhoods? Thank you. I'm going to speak faster this time, so um, <laughs> I want to run. I want to run for city council because I love the city. I want it to be safe. I want it to be open and healthy for my family, for everyone. Uh, for years to come, um, I want to walk through what you can expect from me, given the opportunity to serve you on city council. One, I'm going to prioritize public safety. I'm going to advocate for our police and fire men and women. I'll actively work with organizations and resources to help combat homelessness. Um, I want to oversee responsible growth and protect our parks and open space. Um, I'm going to promote business friendly policies. It's very important that we provide an environment for businesses to come in for us to continue to be financially healthy. Um, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be proactive uh, to support the city. I'm going to be continuous learning, transparent, and taking the time to really understand other perspectives. I'm going to be open, I'll be honest, um, and I'll be accessible. And I'll be a steward for the city. Um, so I'm working hard to meet everyone. I've knocked on 1,500 doors. So um, if I didn't see you, hopefully I get a chance to see you out there. Have a great rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And now we will invite the candidates for mayor. Ben Slater and Mark Murray. Choose whichever of the three. So we'll begin this evening with uh, Mayor Murphy with a one minute opening statement. We've all about this respect. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. And thanks to all that are here this evening. Uh, certainly to the Orange Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this event and Samuel O'Kane College. This evening. Um, I'm really proud of the city of Orange. I'm proud to be the mayor of my hometown. Orange is a safe city. It's got a proud tradition of outstanding public safety services, our police, our fire, and all of the supporting services that go along with it. We're fiscally strong and responsible while we're investing in additional personnel and amenities to serve our community. Our business community is strong. We have a great chamber of commerce. Whether it's auto sales, whether it's banking services, whether it's our medical community, you see how they're just investing uh, multi million dollars in new labs. Orange business is vibrant and continues to grow. Um, you know, the approaches that we're dealing with, uh, both coming out of the pandemic, but also the proactive approaches to our homeless issues and challenges, I'm proud of as well. And I'm proud of my pop later. How's that? <laughs> Thank you very much. This is later. Orange is a great city. My family's been proud to call Orange home since the 1800s. I'm running for mayor because we're facing serious problems that are being ignored by tired leadership. My opponent has been on the Orange City Council for 27 years. We just heard how wonderful things are in Orange. Let's pull back the curtain. Homelessness, crime, the sewing mill and mountains of debris, proposed high density developments in existing neighborhoods and continued threats to open spaces are only a few of the issues. My opponent has accepted thousands of campaign contributions from developers. Orange has an unfunded liability for employee pensions of $280 million. The state auditor's most recent report on fiscal health ranked Orange 47th from the bottom out of 423 cities evaluated. There are only 46 cities between us and Compton, ranked the worst. Orange desperately needs new leadership. Thank you. We'll go to question number one, uh, and then we'll go to the mayor. What do you consider to be top of mind issues that the city needs to address in the near term to maintain the quality of life that makes Orange unique? And what would you do about it? And time on these questions is two minutes. Okay, thank you. 
Well, I touched on it earlier. I mean, the priorities are safety, homelessness, um, fiscal responsibility, being able to invest in those services, and then parks and open space as well would be the, the four things that I would uh, look at. Um, overall, our crime statistics are down, despite what my uh, colleague over here has mentioned. Uh, from 20 to 21, it's on the website, overall crime's down about 5%. They continue to improve and direct their attention on the uh, homelessness issue, and actually we've added 11 new positions in our police department and an additional sergeant position activation as well. So, investing in our safety, obviously. The homelessness issue, I'm really proud of what's happened so far this year. We've taken 88 people off the street and found homes for them, including a family of five, reunited, and that's all through the added sworn and non sworn resources to address the issue. Our bike and our heart teams, our dedicated personnel, they focus on repeat contacts, and we're starting to see some benefits from that. Our actual time uh, count is declining over the last two years as well. Are we done yet? Absolutely not. But the, the team we put together, we reached out to settle a network, faith-based, nonprofits, and literally 33 different volunteer organizations to put together the services to go ahead and move forward with our homelessness outreach. And, and you know, if I start mentioning it, I'll, I'll uh, leave people out, but about food care, of OC, the last thing I played from downtown and Orange. Love Orange, Be Well OC are just uh, a few of those names. Physical responsibility. Over the past uh, two years, we actually have looked at and invested in both uh, refinancing some of the debt to allow us to have an operating expense and save the taxpayers six and a half million dollars a year. Related to the fiscal responsibilities of the retirement system that was mentioned by my colleague earlier. So, and I didn't get to talk about parks, but I will. <laughs> so, as has been mentioned, homelessness is one of the top issues in the city of Orange. Uh, there have been efforts to address it, but we need to do much better and we need to solve this problem. My plan is to get together the faith based organizations and nonprofits, create a homeless task force that have people have already volunteered to be on it. The government has said that we cannot remove homeless people unless we can provide beds for them. So we've got to get together and find places, not permanent housing, but temporary beds where we can take them to, have them assess, give them the help they need. If they're not willing to have help, have us help them, then they need to be removed. And if that means they have to go to jail, that's what we're gonna to have to do because we're not gonna put up with a home-free lifestyle in Orange anymore. Fiscal transparency is another problem. As I mentioned, uh, I just touched on some of those issues. We've got to get our arms around what's going on at City Hall and figure out why we have this huge unfunded liability. Policing is also a very high priority. We've got to make sure that we're protecting our citizens and our businesses at all times. That is the number one responsibility for a city. And lastly, the Sully Miller mess over on Catella that's been accumulating for over 20 years, that has got to be cleaned up and removed. And that needs to remain open space as the citizens have said they want. Mr. What do you consider to be the greatest opportunity for economic development in Orange County or city of Orange? Well, one of the biggest problems, Gabby, is that it takes so long to process new businesses through the city of Orange. I know developer friends that have tried to do business in Orange and both Laguna Beach, and they said it's harder to do business in Laguna Beach, I'm sorry, in the city of Orange than it is in Laguna Beach, and that is nothing to be proud of. We haven't had a department head in community development for quite a long time. That department is understaffed. It's taking way too long to get projects uh, through. And I also want to touch on this. We need to take steps to get traffic moving better. We have an opportunity to install off ramps at least, which would provide access to the Orange Mall or the village, whatever it's called. And we need to get those off ramps put in to unclog the mess at Catella and Low Ranch Road. We need to get traffic moving in Orange. That will also help business. Mr. Mayor? 
Thank you. Um, I just comment on the off ramps. You do that at the expense of 100 plus homeowners. So be prepared for that discussion as well. Because I have the off ramps. For me, it's around the business community. We, we need to attract another hotel in town, for instance. There's a rent space built for that. We need to continue to, to encourage people to invest in their businesses. UCI just did a major investment. Uh, Providence just did a major investment. And then the sales tax generators in town, whether they be auto sales, whether they be SC Fuels and some of those folks, continue to work with them because they continue to grow. It doesn't have to be all new names. We have some really proven names in the city. And we have to pay attention to those folks each and every day. Mayor, how do we attract and retain police officers in the city of Orange? There's no secret because there's been widely reported that cities across the state of California are struggling to identify talent and onboard police officers for a variety of reasons that we're probably very reasons. But how, how do we as a city become an attractive destination for men and women to start to on Well, I think it starts at the top with quality of the leadership of, this, of the department. And we're in able hands with a homegrown chief that actually lives in town. The previous chief lived in town as well. And that's a testament to a quality of life issue. When you have your own police chief that's living in this community, that doesn't happen to most other places. But from there, you do the recruiting. We start to see laterals. We have 12 uh, candidates currently coming out of the academy and starting to do the training of things. And we'll have another five as well that will follow that. So we should have 17, 18 new people on the street over the next uh, six months of the year. It takes time, as you well know, Mr. Ambassador, for three years in the police department. You don't just simply turn folks loose out on the street. They go through training, they go through the rest. But the key is the reputation of the department, the reputation of the city, and being willing to support those endeavors when you need investments, whether it be in body camps and uh, the rest of the protective tools, whether it be in the training side of things, and as well, making sure that you're finding folks that represent the quality of life and, and orange and their core values as well. Mr. Schlater. We have to be sure that we hire the best offices that are available and have good screening processes. Um, also, we have to make sure that we are paying our officers a competitive wage so they're not tempted to go to another city. And I'm afraid that this has happened in Orange uh, too often. It's, it's been tempting. We train them. We spend our resources training them, and they leave and go to other agencies. And that's a shame. And we also need to continue to create pride in our department. We need to support our rank-and-file members. They're out there protecting us every day of the week, every day of the year. and. We really need to make sure that we support these officers as much as we possibly can. So, as candidates for mayor, I want to pose this question because obviously you are the leader of the city. We represent the city in front of those cities. But Orange County is a county of 34 cities and unincorporated areas in some of the boundaries of the city of Orange. What role should the city of Orange play in shaping the future of the county? while preserving and protecting that which is good and unique to our city. I've always been an advocate for working with uh, other agencies and other cities and uh, around the county. We all, we join each other, we love each other, we've got to work together and cooperate. And I know this cooperative agreements uh, with other cities for uh, fire departments and so forth, but we need to be at the forefront of that so that all of us can be as well protected as we can in Orange County. And one of the things that we've got to work together with as cities that are adjacent to each other is the homeless issue. And that is something that we can't just say we're an island in Orange County. We've got to work with other agencies as well to see if they can help us resolve this problem also. Um, hopefully that's that question. Eric? Well, thank you. The it's a couple of things. One, lead by example, the active and leadership roles of the regional commissions and committees. I'm fortunate to be the chair of OCTA uh, this year and have worked hard in that role as well. OCTA would be what for those who are not? I'm sorry, Orange County Transportation Authority. 
So anything that moves, buses, trains, uh, and the rest. Um, I, I think as well, the cooperation with other cities, a great example is the riverbed situation. It took a team effort related from Anaheim, Orange, the county, the sheriff's department, as well to collectively go after that particular issue and, and uh, take care of that particular situation and find those folks uh, other places to live and, and, uh, and uh, reside. But the best part of all of it is, and we learned it, it's one of those positive things you learn out of the pandemic. The mayors of all 34 cities got together on the phone every Thursday night for a year and a half. And it was simply an exchange of ideas, simply an exchange of what, is, what works where you are, what doesn't work. Hey, have you guys ever run into this? At first, it was like, hey, do you know where the, where the vaccine is? Is there anybody getting vaccine this week? Is there anybody getting masks? But over time, it became much, became much more than that. And we continue that on, a, on an ongoing basis, and I'm, and I'm hopeful because the challenge is there are very few directly elected mayors in the county. Most of them are rotational, so they're new every year. And so developing those relationships and extending those relationships can be incredibly important in regionally based issues, whether it be homeless, whether it be law enforcement, whether it be water. I mean, the range of things, sanitation, the, the range of things are, are uh, enormous. So it's important that we has a seat at the table and takes an active role in those organizations and commissions. The mayor, I'll come to you with this question. If you could change one thing in the zoning code and just wave that magic wand, what would it be a lot? Um, I think, uh, let's see, zoning code. I don't know that I would change anything per se. I do agree that sometimes the, the um, review process is laborious. And especially with the amount of requirements that the state has for us to go through, along with uh, um, the reviews, et cetera, I'd like for there to be a way that we can streamline some of that activity specifically um, in terms of uh, in terms of folks who put their hard money, hard earned money, up to apply for whatever that particular business or idea is. But nothing comes to mind immediately that gosh, I want to wave my magic wand. And change everything to one or the other kind of thing. Mr. Slater? We have some ongoing issues in Old Town where the zoning could be reduced to uh, help preserve historic structures, and that needs to still be done because we're not in compliance with the general plan that the city adopted, which is illegal. Um, other than that, I would uh, like to take a trip up to Sacramento and tell them how long they are to force us to have to build. Secondary units on our properties, and we have to accept that, and we have to turn our neighborhoods into single-family residential neighborhoods into multi-family neighborhoods with cars parked everywhere. That's not right. And letting us convert our garages to residences, and all of that is a state issue, and we need to do all we can to make sure that we push back on that and hopefully get rid of that. There's a lawsuit pending that hopefully will remove that. If not, then there will be another issue on the ballot probably in 24 to get that resolved. Mr. Sure. If, if we're waving a magic wand at the state level, I, I'd like to do a bigger swat than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Slater, a civic engagement in the community is important. How would you promote greater public participation in the governing process of our city? And what role does this business play in shaping the city's economic future? So we have a lot of commissions and committees in the city that are appointed by the city council. And now that we've gone to districts, I'd like to give every district representative an opportunity to put their person on every one of these commissions and committees, starting the planning commission on down. And I'm sorry, yeah, well, so, uh, there's two part question is if civic engagement is important in the community, so how would you promote greater public participation in the governing process and what role does business play in shaping the city's economic future? Well, I'm happy that in fact, this is great that the Chamber of Commerce is sponsoring that. It's good to have a strong Chamber of Commerce in the city, and they need to be advocates for business growth and development in our city. Maybe we need an ombudsman. But 
the city has got to work with our businesses because sales tax is that sales tax growth or what pays the bills in our cities. That's that and property taxes are, are pretty much it. And so, you know, replacing commercial and, re and retail with housing is not the answer. Housing costs us more money. We need to really work hard to, to uh, generate sales tax dollars for our city. It'll help us pay for roads, police, fire, parks, all of it. It's really the way to go. It's the only way cities can survive. Sure. Uh, I agree. I mean, the business community's lifeblood and, and really is the engine that makes the city of Orange go. Certainly, the chamber does a great job in assisting with that. But I mean, just to give you a benchmark example, city of Fullerton, city of Orange, roughly the same size, roughly the same age. Um, city of Orange generates two times the sales tax of the city of Fullerton does. Um, we're certainly in much better economic shape than Fullerton as well, and I don't mean to pick on that per se, but it's a parallel example as a result of paying attention to the business community, working with them when they have opportunities for growth and augmentation, and as well making certain that it's a business friendly place to work. But the question of concerning participation and the rest, I think one of the things we got to do is get much better on the technological front in terms of taking in additional information, participation, the rest on any of our hearings any of our public meetings, et cetera, because what I see is oftentimes there's a, there's a group of folks that you start to recognize because they're familiar faces and that's all great, but I just wonder if we did outreach in terms of providing open lines to either Zoom or to something else on some of these commissions and committee hearings, not study sessions, for instance, or plus and specific plans, a good example, public meetings coming up over the next uh, while. I think that would provide some opportunities maybe for people that aren't comfortable leaving their homes, either still dealing with pandemic issues or, or whatever. Um, that's one thing. And I have no problem as well, considering augmenting some of the committees and commissions as appropriate as we move forward. In fact, we, got, we added a Parks and Activities Commission this year with members on it. They've already been active in bringing new activities to the City of Orange. In fact, there's a movie night over at uh, um, El Camino Park uh, coming up that you should look for as well. And that's another example where we've got brand new folks from a wide range of activities tossing ideas together. Well, let's have some fun now. Oh, so okay. I have having fun. We're not stars, so we'll just have <laughs> on that fun. So, uh, the mayor, favorite author? Mm, favorite author? Um, I, honestly, I enjoy autobiographies, and so um, I've read several over the last year, year or two that uh, um, were all all done well, and probably most written to a certain extent. But uh, so I don't I don't know that I, I'm not a big fiction reader. I'm more of a, of a history buff and uh, and uh, autobiography type uh, guy. So that, that, that would be my answer. Mr. Slater, I would say James Mishner, if you haven't read Hawaii and Centennial. Highly recommend. Mr. Slater, favorite Orange County Beach? I'd have to say Laguna Beach. Here? Uh, Monarch Beach, it was where my wife and I, 25 plus years ago, got married on the sand before we had our reception in the morning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing you nailed that number. What's right? <laughs> your favorite sports team? Uh, it's got to be the Lakers, number one, uh, followed by the Angels and the Rams. Okay. Mr. Slater? Uh, Daniels. Mr. Slater, favorite world leader? Uh, Past or present? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to say Winston Churchill. Mayor? You, you, you took the first impulse, so I'm going to say Ronald Reagan. So the next one's going to be your favorite vice president, so I think we should answer that one. Mr. Slater? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Mr. Mayor, favorite orange spot? Um, the plaza itself right now, the Plaza Park is a pretty extraordinary spot. Um, and the life and the hours of the life down there have grown so much over the last time. So I would say the Orange Plaza. And then, you know, from there you have lots of choices of what you do and where you go next. Mr. Slater? I mean, also agree with uh, Mark, uh, the Orange Plaza is my favorite spot, but I really love getting out to Orange Park acres. <laughs> Mayor, favorite movie of all time? Favorite 
movie of all time. Let's see. I'm going to do something sort of eclectic and say the buddy Holly story. It's like Shawshank Redemption. It's like your favorite high school subject. Geography. Mayor? Uh, math. Okay. So with that, we'll end the, uh, the John Hughes for a while. And uh, we'll come back to you for a closing statement, and we'll start with you, Mr. Slater. I put myself through college and attained a business degree. I've owned a very successful orange business for 37 years. I served on the Orange City Council from 94 to 02. I defeated cancer when I was 19 and survived a heart attack and quadruple bypass surgery 13 years ago. I'm a survivor and a fighter. Put me to work fighting for you at City Hall. We all have common interests. Like you, I want a safe, fiscally sound city with common sense government. We all want good, successful businesses to shop and dine at. We want safe, well-maintained parks. I've been campaigning door to door since March, and I've heard your concerns. No matter if you're Republican, Democratic, or no party preference, I'm going to listen to you and represent you at City Hall. Friends know me for my honesty, and I pledge to be always honest and transparent with you. Together, we will preserve and protect our city of Orange. Mayor. Well, thanks again to the Orange Chamber of Commerce, San Diego Canyon College, and to Ambassador Vasquez for the moderation this evening. As I mentioned before, we're coming out of the pandemic, but we're in a strong position in these challenging economic times. We're physically strong, we're able to invest in the resources necessary for the quality of life issues, whether it be homelessness, whether it be safety, and also to add and improve parks and open space and community events. I too am interested, by the way, and didn't get a chance to talk about it too much, but we directed uh, our staff to begin discussions about the acquisition of Sully Miller at the last meeting, and we're, I'm going to see that through uh, in, in these next two years, but we'll get two years to analyze it. I ask you to join the Orange City Firefighters, City of Orange Police Association, Council Members Nichols, Dimitru, Monaco, Tavalaris, Mayor Tita Smith, in supporting and voting for me as your mayor. I am so thankful for the opportunity to be mayor of my hometown, and with your help, I know we'll do it again. Some people come and go, but I've been proud to live right here in Orange my entire life. And together, we're going to make one of the great places to live, work, and raise a family. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness to enter the public arena and become candidates for public office. If there was ever a time when we needed leadership at the municipal level, across Orange County, across the state, and across our nation, at the local level, uh, this is the day, this is the time. So to all of you who are candidates, I salute you for your willingness to step into the public square. I think we're grateful to this audience tonight. You have been fabulous. You have followed all of our requests. We appreciate it very much. And most of all, to the community college here, thank you, Rita, for the hospitality. It was terrific. Chancellor, thank you so much. And it's been a real pleasure to be here tonight. Don't forget to vote now. Have a good night. Be safe. Thank you. Really? Why would you do that?